Morning, everybody. Welcome to this Friday's webinar from Annika Digital. Uh, it's myself and Stanley today with Gurpreet. Hi, Gurpreet. Morning, Anne. Hi, everybody. So, Gurpreet, say a quick hi and tell everybody what you do, because this is your first time co-hosting, isn't it? Yep, it's my first time. So, uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Gurpreet Purewell, and I'm a marketing exec here at uh, Annika Digital, and have been now for just under 10 months. So, yeah. is, it, is it that long already? Gosh, that's gone so quickly. Uh, you're, gone. Definitely, you're definitely part of the furniture and we can't do without you. So you've become indispensable very quickly. Uh, Katie, who's normally my co-host, is actually on holiday with the kids today. And um, so she she's she's not joining us. So um, if you're new to Annika's webinars, which we hold every Friday, um, what we're going to do, first of all, is hold a poll. So I'll hand over to Gerprit to do that. And then once we finish the poll, um, Gurpreet will disappear and answer your questions in the chat if she can, um, or she'll save them up to the end, um, and then I'll start presenting. So um, over to you, Gurpreet. Brilliant. So I'll start polling now. So how would you describe your marketing setup? Number one, you're, I'm a student and currently unemployed, so not doing any marketing at the moment. Number two, I'd use just one channel, e.g. social media. Number three, we use several different channels to market our business. Uh, number four, we use several different channels to market our businesses in brackets e-commerce. Number five, we work in silos. Our marketing is not integrated. Number six, we attempt to not work to not to so work together on some projects. And then finally, number seven, we have a proactive integrated approach. Sorry, there's a typo. You can click more than one, of course, because um, we sort of want to know what you're doing from a perspective of um, uh, the number of channels, but also whether you are proactively trying to integrate your approach or not. So what's the results looking like then, uh, Gopri? Majority of people are going for, we just use one channel. So we've got 27%, three people have clicked that one so far. So that's the leading one. Okay, and and any any anything on any of the others? Have we got any um, second runners? We've got a real mix. So a few people, 17% have used top, the top one. So they're a student or currently employed, so not really doing too much marketing. Um, at the moment, the leading two are they either use one social media channel or um, they use several different channels to market the business through lead okay. Yeah, we sort of expect that. I mean, um, you know, it doesn't have to be just social. You could be just doing email marketing or you could just be doing SEO. Um, so... Um, we just I don't think I'd shared the handout, so you should be able to see the handout now. It was just a question there. Excellent. OK, well, that's sort of what I expected. So I'm going to now share my screen. So if I go over and share properly, if you can let me know um, that that's working. Once I'm sharing my screen, I can't actually see the chat anymore. So is it showing? Yeah, yeah, we can all see it. Integrate your marketing strategies. Yeah, that's perfect. And the other thing you need to know is uh, top right above where you can see my screen, there's a little arrow. So if you want to make the screen bigger um, and then I'll I, I'll dive in. Cool. Um, let's get going. So I'll see you in about 50 minutes. Brilliant. See you on. Good luck. Bye. Bye. Excellent. So a little bit about me. So um, if you haven't met me before, I'm the founder and CEO of Annika. Um, I've been in digital marketing for 21 years and I've actually been in marketing for nearly 30. Um, and um, we've been I've been running uh, Annika for 16 years, although um, I do have a managing director and another director, Darren and Angie, who help with a lot of the day to day decision making. Um, my day job is mainly client facing, to be honest. I do a lot of consultancy and I'm a trainer. Um, my specialist subjects are sort of paid media, analytics, e-commerce marketing, and I'm I'm, I'm really into all the AI and chat GPT stuff that's happening as well. So that's sort of an area that I'm very interested in. Um, I do have um, quite, uh, two books. Um, the first one is the A10 Marketing Framework, um, which if you haven't already downloaded, you can just do a search on the website and find that. But the new one, which has literally come off the press last week, is Integrate, which is actually what this uh, webinar is about. Um, so we've got... Uh, We've got an 80 page book and there's a link um, which we'll share in a little while um, for you to create an integrated marketing strategy. And I've just pulled out a little bit of that book today. Um, we also have a podcast and the weekly webinars, of course, and there's my socials. 
Uh, if you're not familiar uh, with Annika, um, we, as I said, we established, I established Annika in 2007. Uh, there's 23 staff at the moment. We've got around 40 clients and we offer seven services. Um, we're very transparent. We're quite data driven and we've won quite a few um, awards. Um, and we work with some really good clients, um, quite a few of which you'll know along this list, but we work with them. Um, both B2B and B2C, and also um, some of our e-commerce clients like um, Charles Bentley, Bookstador, those are both local businesses, but we've worked with people like Dykeman Shoes in the past um, and various others. Okay, so my first part of my talk is why your marketing needs to be integrated. Um, and um, I'm gonna just sort of give you a little bit of um, uh, a hint of the sorts of channels and, and, and in our case, the services that we offer. Um, and we use this acronym POETIC to describe what we do. Um, but if you could look underneath each of these, you can see many of the marketing channels that you might want to consider. So we've got things like paid search, we've got shopping ads, we've got SEO, we've got social media, we've got um, uh, PR, um, we've got things like AI and um and machine learning, uh, we've got um, conversion rate optimization, we've got um, all the creative services like UX and creating the assets. So you can see that um, there's various, there's lots of elements in marketing, um, both across digital and traditional channels. And um, if you can imagine, it's quite easily to not only just work in one of these, but also actually to work in one very, very specific um, channel within each of these sort of um, streams. So it, you can imagine why um, there's a tendency um, for people to become quite siloed because it's very difficult to know everything about everything. Um, and so what happens is, is often you get individuals or teams that specialize and actually as you become more advanced, that's more common. However, just because you um, or your team are specialized, it doesn't mean to say you can't work with the other teams and have what we would call a more integrated approach across channels. But also, if you think about the way people interact with your business, some of them are going to be online. Some of them might actually meet you offline. You might even set, you might even have a, um, a shop as well and you might um, sell offline. I mean, that's exactly what Annika does. We run lots of events and our sales team actually meet real people. Everything's not ha doesn't happen in the digital world just because you have a digital marketing agency. So you can see that um, there's lots of opportunities for people to interact with you and how they're actually going to see the content and the ads that you create. Now, a good reason for why you need an integrated approach is because you need to understand um, where your audience are and the different touch points and stages of the sales funnel. Um, and so this is a classic um, sales funnel that we've written on the uh, on the right hand side, which goes through the different stages of awareness, interest, consideration, conversion, conversion and loyalty and retention. So if you think about um, different people at different stages, um, as they interact with you, they're likely to come across different channels. So they might see something on social media or if you're a bigger brand, you might have a TV ad. They might come onto your website and do some research. They might sign up for an email. They might get some emails from you. They might see some paid ads um, or they might do a search um, in Google um, and actually uh, click on a PPC or um, your SEO and actually then convert. And then once they become a customer, you're likely to send them emails on a regular basis or you might even do some remarketing ads. So as you can imagine, people at very different stages and are going to have very different needs along those different stages. And although we've drawn this as a nice funnel, in actual fact, um, user journeys can be very complicated because they can interact with you both on and offline and they can interact with you using multiple um, touch points and across multiple channels. And because of that, conversion tracking can be very difficult. And the concept of conversion attribution, which if you're not familiar is the um, is actually deciding which conversion gets the credit, uh, which channel gets the credit for the conversion, um, that is going to be very difficult or can be very difficult. And it's going to become even more difficult as cookies are removed and 
and as different platforms and browsers become more concerned about privacy and not tracking everything you do. So a good example was um, about um, two years ago, Apple introduced the iOS 14 update. And as a result of that, everybody had to then agree to how to be tracked. And of course, most people didn't. And um, consequently, um, Facebook, um, which is now Meta, of course, um, suddenly lost all its tracking information, which not only meant that it was a problem for advertisers and for them, but also it meant that you started to get really rubbish ads because um, you, you, you weren't being targeted in the same way as you were before. So you can see that um, understanding where users are, what their needs are, where they are, the sort of their wants and everything, and where they are in the, in the user journey means that you can A, target them, but also you can modify your message and your ads and your content to meet their needs at that particular stage in the journey. So if you look at all these things together, um, here's a sort of a classical marketing um, benefit slide where you can sort of see some of the um, advantages of having an integrated strategy. So it's definitely about, um, you know, improving who sees your ads because you're more likely to get to more people. Um, the messages are going to be more targeted. Um, there's going to be a better customer experience. I've just realized that my partner hasn't opened the door. So that's going to be problematic. Um, there's going to be a better customer experience, um, um, more consistent branding, uh, customer data and insights is going to be better. There's increased effectiveness, increased in, uh, efficiency, and an increased return on uh, investment. Um, bear with me, I'm going to have to sort out my babysitting situation. About that everybody i um <laughs> my partner's in the garden and the grandchildren are at the front door so <laughs> let me go back and share my screen so hopefully if you can just let me know again whether you can see my screen is that okay go prick yeah that's fine Anne. thank you okay so having sort of stressed some of the benefits of integrated marketing i want to take it to a different level and i want to talk about the apocalypse that's coming in marketing. Because everything that we know now is changing. Changes to cookies, cookies and privacy legislation, which is going to mean there's a loss of data and there's going to be the inability to do remarketing tactics, which we're really reliant on for uh, lots of the things that we do. Uh, the, uh, the huge impact that ChatGPT had in November where suddenly everybody realized what AI and machine learning was all about. Well, that they, these tools are just going to explode and they're going to be getting better all the time. And we're going to be using them in marketing. And we already do. Uh, if you look at the stuff that Annika is doing, we've been talking about AI uh, on a, a sort of a monthly basis since uh, Christmas. And in fact, we were even talking about it last year because we knew that it was coming. And this is going to change our jobs. And the other thing that's happening is, is that the automation by ad platforms, which has been happening for five years now, is getting much more, um, is much more um, sophisticated because the campaign delivery, bidding and optimization is effectively going to make us redundant going forward. So we really need to be considering the full scale um, implication of what's happening um, with all of this automation and all of these changes. Now, one of the things we can do with an integrated strategy is, is we can negate some of these issues and also we can help um, to try and alleviate some of the, the changes and actually uh, prepare for them. So I'm going to be doing um, presenting five different strategies this morning. Um, the first one is the use of strategic themes, which is how you can um, think of it more from a solutions perspective rather than a channel's perspective. Um, the use of consistent and effective content, um, the use of search insights in one channel to inform campaigns in another, um, remarketing and sequential campaigns, 
And then uh, the bit that I think is probably um, slightly more technical, but probably the most important is data integration, tracking and automation. So uh, let us um, go through. And I just wanted to share this amazing picture. So this is um, a seven foot Velociraptor, which I find really difficult to pronounce um, at the T-Rex um, show that we went to. And what I'm basically saying is, is that if you don't integrate, if you don't automate, if you don't use AI, if you don't sort out your data issues, you are going to become a dinosaur. And it's my job today to stop you from becoming a dinosaur. I am expecting my two dinosaurs to run up the stairs at any minute. So do, do forgive me if it suddenly gets very noisy. OK, so strategy number one is use of strategic themes. And the way that this works is that instead of focusing on um, the specific channels, we focus on the uh, on the objectives and the outputs that we want to achieve. So let's um, use this diagram to explain what's happening. So first of all, we understand what the objectives are of the business. So an objective could be 20 percent growth in your sales or your revenue. Now, one of the ways you could achieve that is just put up your prices by 20 percent. But it's quite likely that that will end up with less revenue as everybody comes very frustrated and all your customers disappear. So we have to think about how we can achieve that. So the best way of doing that is, first of all, to carry out a whole series of audits and insights to understand what your customers are doing, what you're currently doing, what's working, where the opportunities are. And then you can see you can end up with a whole load of strategic themes which you can use to actually um, undertake your marketing strategies. And so I've got some different ones here. We've got our branding and trying to increase awareness, engagement, optimization of always on campaigns, new customer acquisition, which is pretty common. Most people want to do that. Increase your site conversion rate and increase customer re retention and lifetime value. So generally, when you undergo a marketing project, you're not going to try and do everything. You'll probably focus on maybe one or two major ones. So that might be new customer acquisition or it might be improving what you're currently doing, particularly if if, if you have got campaigns that maybe aren't um, as profitable as you'd like them to be. Um, I'll show you what the individual tactics look like in a minute. So we'll have a look at that. But once you've decided which ones you do, you're going to create activity plans um, calendars, resource allocation and budgets, and then you've also got a measure and report on it as well. So this is an example for the um, a, a new customer acquisition. And effectively, what I've got here is all of the different um, tactics across the poetic framework and then examples of the sorts of things that you might want to do. Now, um, obviously, there'll be much more detail in each of these. And in some cases, for example, if it's e-commerce, you might the paid search might focus on shopping ads. You might not need LinkedIn ads. You might prefer to go for Meta. So this is just sort of an example. This is a little bit B2B focused because you can see I've got LinkedIn a few times there. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is, is that instead of you focusing on individual channels, you're focusing on a mix of these as if these are like strategy cards to see what combination of things you need to do to actually achieve your um, objective of customer acquisition. Also, when you lay this out, it might be that depending on who you're working with, and as in our case as an agency, some of this stuff might be in-house, or um, if you are in-house, you might need help on some of these things with a freelancer or an agency. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be doing all of it and you might actually phase some of it as well, um, depending on your priorities and your budget. So, that, so that's what um, strat strategy cards and strategy themes looks like. And it's a way of focusing on what you want to achieve rather than just explaining what the paid search team is going to do. You know, we need to be thinking about how the paid search team and the SEO team can work together. So the next strategy I want to talk to you about is use of consistent and effective content across channels. Um, and this is all about the uh, it's all about the concept of doing what's one thing first once and doing it really, really well and then utilizing it across multiple places. So the first um, so there's four strategies in here all together. So first is audience first content, personalized and branding content, an integrated content strategy 
And then this idea of creating content once and shattering it so that it can be used in multiple formats. OK, so let's just look and imagine your your audience and the people you want to target. And in general, blanketed targeting, sort of um, spray and pray, I think it's commonly called. Um, basically, you put loads of content out there and you just hope that some people are going to want it. Whereas actually what we want to do is we want to have a, um, channeled um, into different segments. Um, often we refer to it as personas. And then what we do is we target the content and a marketing strategy to each of these different segments. It's often, I mean, if you think about it, if you go back to traditional marketing, we often talk about segmentation and proposition to individual segments. So it's following the same um, line, but because we can do this digitally, we can actually break these segments down into quite um, uh, more narrow or specific focuses. Whereas if you think of something like a radio or TV ad, that same ad goes out to everybody. And I just want to give Tom Shardlow credit for this. This is um, something that he's presented. And if you're interested in his work, if you go and have a look at our um, the webinars, he's done a couple on creative strategy. But this was an ad that he saw. Um, I think it was a shopping ad in Google. And um, when you look at this, you're not really so sure whether you're selling, whether the company's selling the sink, um, the kitchen um, or the tap. And you don't really know anything about it. You don't know who it is. Um, it's not really given us any um, clue to actually what's going on and what they're selling. So the first thing that you can do is just add your brand. And by doing this, when somebody sees that photograph, at least they know who it is that's selling it. Because lots of people could be selling this individual product. But that doesn't really help you because in social media, when you're going through your feed very, very quickly, you still don't really understand what they're selling. Are they selling the tap? They're selling the sink, etc. And so um, what you can do is you can augment the ad by adding a lot of extra information to give a clue as to what actually this is about. And so actually what this ad is trying to sell is this is this tap, which is a boiling water tap. So it isn't any tap. This is an instant boiling water tap, you know, using the sort of um, Marks and Sparks approach of um, selling it but you've got a few things there you've got a trusted rated you've got instant heat you've got the product name and you've got the brand and what it's done is flatten the brand so if you go back from there to there you can see what a difference and that will really stand out so whether you like the sort of flame um 70s flame style or not um at least you can see immediately who it is, what it is, and why they, you know, and why they should click through. And that's a little credit to Tom. The next type of integrated content strategy I want to talk about is the overlap and working together with the search, social, and PR team. Now, this is something that we've been doing for a long time, and um, I'm going to sort of not go through all the bullet points, but I'm going to sort of tell, talk to you about some of the advantages of doing this. So first of all, um, you still get the majority of people coming to websites from the search engines, whether it's paid search or whether it's SEO. And one of the biggest hurdles are being found in the search engines is, um, apart from having really good authoritative content, we use the EAT um, uh, as a way of uh, e explaining that, is that you need to build the authority of your website and you need to get links and domain authority. And so the rise of digital PR has been phenomenal over the last sort of five years or so, because if you can get a link in um, the press or in the media, usually it's a high authority domain and that link will help your, um, your SEO. And also it acts as a um, content distribution channel as well. So if you're talking about something on your website and you get a press release on that subject, then people will click through and they'll uh, link to you as well, which is you know, obviously one of the important parts of, um, of the content strategy and the purpose of content on your website. If you also consider how social links together, you'll often notice that you know, we'll write content in social, in, in for, uh, on a blog, and then we we'll use things like uh, email and social and PR to distribute that content. But socials become much more powerful 
because people are starting to use social platforms like Pinterest and TikTok as actual search engines. So their focus is on discovery of products as well. And you see different uh, people with different ages and demographics and different interests using those different platforms. And in some cases, people are going to TikTok rather than Google, which is quite surprising. Now, if you can think about um, you as a brand and say you offer, I don't know, a makeup product, for example, or consumer product, um, what you tend to find is, is that a certain number of people will know your brand and if they search for you, that's going to be a lot cheaper than, um, you know, being found for the name of the product. It's going to be a lot easier to be found. It means you don't have to spend loads of money on Google ads. So um, what happens is, is that the number of people that know about you cap the or limit the amount of search queries for your brand. So what you need to do is you need to drive awareness. And so one amazing strategy that you can do to work together is, is if you can get people to use your product in social media and you can get lots of influencers and people talking about your product and then you actually release some press releases about the product and refer them back to over to say TikTok where they're all using the product those stories will appear at the top of the search engines which will be really useful you'll get loads of press releases about it it can often go um, if you if you're lucky and you and you work really hard at it, you can even make it go viral. I'm not going to say it often goes viral. You have to work very hard to make it go viral. And then that content and those links will help you get found in the search engine. And what can actually happen is, is that you can drive demand and you can actually increase the number of people that are searching for your brand. Whereas previously <clears throat> it was only the people that knew about your brand. So you can see that. If you are going to have um, an SEO strategy and you are you do want awareness and you do want social media, if you can work them all together, you know, things like answering jour journal requests on Twitter, um, that can be a really integrated and synergistic relationship between them. And it's definitely the way that we approach the ongoing part of our SEO and PR product projects. Um, where we use all three to work together and we even use paid um, ads as well to help with the distribution and get it in front of more people. So you can start to see how um, a really good piece of content can be distributed through multiple purposes and channels. Now, this idea is exactly what we'll be doing with um, the Integrate brochure. Um, book, sorry, and also what we did with the A10. So first of all, you've got to write some really good quality content. It doesn't have to be as, as weighty as the Integrate uh, brochure, but um, something with a little bit of, um, of good quality, unique content. And then what you do is you basically um, look to break it or shatter it into various different elements which can be used across lots of different channels. And I've included things like social media, events, blog, PR, networking, um, thought leadership, get other people to talk about it as well. And so these are some of the examples that you might want to do. You might want to do a video. You might want to do a webinar like we're doing today. You might want to do some infographics. You, want, you might want to do some PR about it. Anything that can shatter that content and get it distributed in lots of different channels is going to increase. And then if you combine that with paid ads as well. So, for example, if you use something like Meta, which is very cheap, or you use um, LinkedIn organically, um, and then you perhaps create some lookalike audiences in uh, Meta and Facebook based on um, your current customers, that, that way you can get it to lots of new people. OK, my next strategy, strategy three, is slightly more detailed and it's using the search term insights that you get from, um, say, Google ads um, in one channel to inform campaigns in another. And it's sort of this concept of how if you think about search engine optimization and Google ads, we off, we, we, we're using the same data to, to try and understand who's searching for things well, why don't we start thinking about using some of the same um, data that we actually get within our Google ads, because then we know what converts and we can then utilize that within our SEO. So let's 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 follow that that idea forward a bit. 
So what we're going to do first of all is I'm going to talk about um, how automation is driving key phrase redundancy in Google Ads so that your website content may become the new key phrase. So this is automation of uh, ad platforms. Um, I'm going to talk about how you can use search term data from PPC um, to obviously to optimize your campaigns, but also to use in other channels. And then what other insights you can get from Google Ads um, and how you can use those for SEO and website improvements. Now, why why are we why are we worrying about this? Why why are we doing this? Well, first of all, for a lot of businesses, particularly startups, it's going to be really difficult to grow the authority of your website and increase the domain ranking um, in the short term. So we normally, from a lot of websites that have got a low starting point or a low domain authority, we generally recommend paid search first and, and other paid channels, of course, because that way we can start to build up a customer database, start to get traffic um, to the website, and so they can start making money. And then that money can be invested in for the more long term strategies around things like um, search engine optimization. Also, when you do search engine optimization, you're taking a bit of a punch, really, on what key phrase you optimize for. Whereas if you've already run um, ads, you can actually use those key phrases to actually influence your strategy when it comes to SEO. So starting with paid search and then going on to SEO is a, is a common approach that we use across a lot of customers. Now, with a bigger client that's already got the domain authority and they've already got some SEO, then we tend to use these in parallel and we can then filter data across in both directions. So why do I say that in Google and Bing ads, um, we're going to not need keywords anymore? Now, this is all to do with that apocalypse that I mentioned early on, is that um, the platforms are using so much AI now that actually they automate a lot of the tasks. They automate the choice of key phrases. They automate the choice of ads. They automate the bidding strategies. And the reason they're doing that is they want to make it so simple that anybody can use the platform. So... What that means is, is that they're starting to move away from the traditional set text ads um, or the search campaigns. I nearly, I nearly combined those two there. For, um, so search and text campaigns where you use to select the key phrases for use in your ads. And then you would have ads that match and landing page that uh, match. And so they already provide quite a few different types of campaigns that are based effectively on the content of your website. Or if it's an e-commerce website, the product feed that takes the content from your website. So let's have a look at those two. So the first one is dynamic search ads or DSAs for short, which use the content of your website to trigger the match with the search term. So to me, this is almost like a form of paid SEO. So it relies on you having good quality content on your page. But uh, if you haven't got the domain authority, you can effectively use it as the content um, to dynamically create an ad and then you pay for that ad to be shown um, um, and when and you actually pay at the point that they click. Hence, it's called PPC. So dynamic search ads look exactly the same as normal text ads, but you haven't had to go to through the process of, of sifting through hundreds or thousands of key phrases to decide um, which ones you're going to make. And so they can be a lot quicker to set up and actually, you can um, use them to find lots of different key phrases, even key phrases that have never been searched for before. Now, the other type of ad that uses um, doesn't rely on you to uh, click on um, to find search terms or key phrases. It's called shopping ads. Um, excuse me. I'm just going to close my door because the children are now in the house. So bear with me a second. So shopping ads, the way they work is you... With an e-commerce website, what you do is you can create a CSV file, but more often than not, you'll create a dynamic feed. And the dynamic feed has all the information about all your products. And it's particularly important because as your products go out and in and out of stock, they have the stock levels. And of course, you don't want to be showing ads when you are you haven't got any stock left. So um, when you set up shopping ads and the new performance max ads, um, which have, have sort of replaced smart shopping, over in Google Ads, 
um, then you use that feed through the bridge of Merchant Centre and um, actually you don't need to add any key phrases at all. Now, just to add to that, Performance Max um, is, has a lot of additional features and there's been quite a few webinars on Performance Max. You can use it to actually um, target specific audiences. You can use it. You can show text ads. You can show videos as well. Um, and that's usually based on the URL. So um, when I'm talking about it in this context, Performance Max can be used to emulate the original Smart Shopping, but actually it's got a lot of other functionality as well. So, and that is 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 where we sort of expect Google to be going with all their ads in. So basically, you know, you don't have to use keywords anymore. You use the symbols of the content of the page. So in these types of campaigns, the ones in blue, um, you don't bid on key phrases, um, but in most cases, you can see the search terms that were used to actually trigger the ads. Uh, you get less data in Performance Max, but you do get much more data in standard shopping and in the DSAs. Now, this is really useful because it means you can add negative phrases in, and you can also learn what works, and you can optimize um, your campaigns or your ads, or you can turn stuff on and off. And also you can use it to create new text campaigns, which can be very specific as well. So having that search term data in the search term report is really, really useful because you can utilize it within the Google Ads campaign, but you can also utilize it externally as well. So where I'm going with this is, is that um, what we can start to do is we can use that, that search term data and actually, we can optimize your website or the page um, as well. And so when you've got a, um, a page or a product page, which has got really good products and titles, that will improve your shopping feed. We can actually optimize that landing page or that content for SEO. And because that page is going to be used for both PPC and SEO purposes, effectively, you're getting um, you know, a double benefit. And what I think will happen in the future is um, that it may evolve to the point where you don't need to enter key phrases at all uh, in the same way that, you know, we've got um, we get, we're getting more and more stuff done for us within the actual account. So I think um, at some point in the future, I don't know when it will be. I'm hoping, it, you know, we'll always be able to add our own key phrases. But the importance of adding uh, key phrases will become less important. And the signals that you get from your website um, and the quality of your web page, which is the point here, will actually determine the performance of your campaigns. So it then you start to see how um, you can utilize that data. So I've got some flows here. Um, as you can imagine, if you've got um, DSA ads or shopping ads, you can optimize your search, search ads. These are your text ads. You can use that content to optimize your um, SEO and your pages. That will help with your product feed, which will help with your performance max. But the other thing that you can do, which you might not have thought about, is you can actually utilize those key phrases for your um, shopping ads in other channels like Amazon and Pinterest and eBay as well. So what we're really saying is, is that the key phrases that we know that work over here particularly um, the high converting ones, are the ones that we should be using to optimize over, over here. Um, and then that will then feed through um, to the rest of the process. I've just got a little slide on uh, shopping ads in Amazon and, and Pinterest. And quite a lot of these uh, platforms will be um, offering ads. So although in Amazon you obviously pay a commission, you can, if you want visibility, you have to advertise as well. Um, and a lot of them are based on the key phrases. They can be based, they can be automatic, they can be based on the product or the profile page, etc. Um, but if you've got um, key phrases that you know work really well in one channel, such as Google Ads, then there's no reason why you can't use these in the other campaigns as well, um, so that that, that um, can benefit. And also the product feed that um, you know you've just you've just optimized over here, um, that product feed is often used in both. Uh, Meta, as well as things like Pinterest and, uh, and other channels. 
Um, it can be utilized for things like your TikTok e-commerce. So um, getting that product feed to be the best it can, um, you know, by using rules or supplementary feeds or making sure your website is good in the first place, that will all filter across and you'll get lots of other um, benefits in other channels. The other sorts of insights that you can use from PPC across over in SEO is the fact that in Google Ads, at the moment, um, we're still doing lots of testing. So we test our ads and we try and improve the click through rate and the conversion rate. So the ad copy that we um, play around with is, is designed to maximize click through rate to help your quality score, which means you then end up paying less and get better visibility. But of course, you also optimize in your conversion rate to reduce the cost per acquisition. So um, that data can be used for things like your description um, in uh, for individual pages. Now, generally, the title is more important for SEO, so you might not want to play with the title, but descriptions are less important um, from a point of view of actually rankings, but they are important for getting people to actually click on your listing in SEO. So if you can learn anything from your Google Ads around, about ads, use that in your SEO. Uh, the other thing that um, I was talking about earlier on was about the fact that if you've got a new website, you're not going to have any traffic. Your SEO is going to take a while to build up. So not only do you not know what works and what doesn't work from a point of view of the types of key phrases, you've got no idea if your website's actually converting properly and whether it's very effective. So if you can throw some paid search traffic for relevant phrases across to your site, get some um, um, your target audience across your site to the, or to your landing pages. You can use your analytics data to sort of understand, you know, how many people leave immediately, which is called the bounce rate, what your conversion rates and, and, and understand what's actually happening. And then that will allow you to make improvements to the landing page. And that will therefore benefit all the traffic coming to your site. So if you can improve the conversion rate of your uh, of a page, not only your SEO traffic and all your other traffic and your direct traffic will benefit, but your PPC traffic as well. So optimizing landing pages for UX and conversion can help both PPC and SEO, which is why I think that's a, a, another part of an integrated strategy. Uh, on that note, I just meant I need to mention Google Analytics. If you are not aware um, Google Analytics, um, the universal Google Analytics 3 stops working at the end of this month and we migrate automatically over to GA4. We've done lots of presentations on this already, um, but if you haven't already uh, migrated over to GA4, get hold of us and uh, we will, um, there is a charge to it, but we can help you implement that and make sure that everything's set up properly. It is not the easiest platform to use, so the implementation does include a report and some training. So if any of you are interested in that, was to can offer up for that at the end. Okay, so finally, I predict um, the shift towards automation means that I think the SEO and the PPC teams and tactics will converge. So I know we've already got the content, SEO, PR, so organic social team working together. I think going forward, the content, uh, SEO, PR, uh, and uh, PPC team will be working more closely together as well. So take note, everybody in the audience, do not become a dinosaur and do not continue to work in silos. OK, the next strategy relates to remarketing. I've got quite a few slides in this section, so I'm going to zoom through. So first of all, if you set up paid social ads, you can target them based on all the different stages of the funnel. Uh, in Facebook, it's specifically, and the others are followed suit. You can actually target people for different stages. So that's really important to know. But these ads are much more powerful when they're linked together using what we call sequential or remarketing campaigns. In other words, you're showing ads to people that have already seen your ads before or already been to your website or already customers of you. So that's the concept of sequential and remarketing campaigns. So first of all, just what remarketing is then, it's one of the most important uh, types of tactics that we use. Um, it's not only for social media, it's across paid media, but remarketing, um, you can include email marketing to a certain extent in there, but it's basically re-engaging with an audience um, and putting your ads or your content in front of them again. So they could have visited your website, which is probably the most common one. They could have purchased or abandoned a product in a car. Uh, they could have um, spent time on your website, but they, they didn't buy anything or contact you. They could have viewed a percentage of a video. They could have engaged with a post or an ad. Um, 
And because they have had that contact with you and you might have engaged with them offline as well, you know, they might have visited a shop, they might be part of a loyalty program, you might have them on your email list. Um, these audiences are class as, classified as warmer um, and thus um, conversions tend to be higher when you re-engage with these particular audience. So let's just talk about classic website remarketing first of all. So first of all, it doesn't really matter how they came to your site in the first place. It could have been through uh, another channel, SEO. They could be regular users. They could have come from email or Google ads or Facebook ads. It doesn't really matter how they got there. Um, and then at that point, they're either going to uh, leave your site or they're going to convert. And of course, if they convert, that's great. You're going to make some money. But assuming that they leave, they're going to um, what's going to happen is, is that um, because they've arrived on your site, they've been cookied or tracked. And then in other as they go around the website. So if we all went to John Lewis now, looked at a pair of jeans, we would then go to Facebook or we go to Gumtree. We would see a John Lewis ad and then oh, I think, oh, yeah, I really wanted those jeans. And then you go back to the site and then you would buy it. OK. Now, sequential uh, campaigns can be slightly different, and I've got three types to show you. So the first is where the same audience see two ads with different messages. Usually that audience will see one, and maybe 24 hours later they will see the second. We use that uh, Facebook a lot to do that. The second type is where they see one ad, and if they engage with that ad or watch the video, say they watch 50% of the video, you stick them in an audience, and then you show only the people in that audience the second ad. And then the third is what we call cross-marketing or cross-channel remarketing is um, we, we, we get people from, say, Facebook that are interested in garden furniture and gardens, home interiors. We um, show them an ad to go and download a guide. They go over to the website. Of course, once they're on the website, they can be cooked. And then you can then show them ads across lots of other channels, which is sort of what I was describing with the John Lewis example. So these are three different types of sequential campaigns. And in these two cases, we're using some form of remarketing. Now, we can use lots of um, different channels in when we are using the sequential approach. So this is one of our multi-phased approaches. So you can use different uh, channels to attract people's attention. They can also come to your product and content pages using various different channels. And then once they've actually arrived on your product or your content uh, page, we can then um, send them a second or sequential um, add to remarket those people that have actually arrived on those um, on those pages. You can also remarket to people within the same channel. So, for example, if somebody's watched a video in YouTube, you can then remarket to them using Google Ads. The other thing you can do is create custom audiences. So, using the same uh, path that we went on just a minute ago, we've got a user that comes to your website. They're either going to leave or they're going to convert. Now, if they leave, what you can do is you can put them into a new audience so that they can then see ads um, on uh, other sites. But also you can have um, visitors that you saw an exhibition or you can have people that watch your webinar or have seen your app or you can basically upload a list or um, create these custom audiences, which can also be used um, to target. And then when they then um, they they then um, see the ad through these custom audiences, they can then return um, back to your website and actually purchase from you. The other thing that you can do with these custom lists or any of these audiences is you also can create what we call lookalike audiences. Now, lookalike audiences is a way of prospecting, and the way that that works is is that you're looking for say your converters. And you're looking for people that are similar to those. So if you've got a list of a thousand people and you load them up into LinkedIn or you load them up into Facebook, you might find 300 of them will match. And then that will be um, uh, an audience that you can then use to create a, a bigger lookalike audience with. There's a couple of other types of remarketing strategies. So dynamic remarketing for e-commerce. So in the John Lewis example, what happens is I went to John Lewis, I looked at a pair of jeans and then suddenly I see jeans everywhere. Now, this requires um, the page to be marked up um, and there's various different ways that we can use dynamic remarketing strategies. So you can actually set a dynamic remarketing campaign in Google. Um, although, um, to be perfectly honest, um, the Performance Max does a really good job of that now because it's got that built in. 
Um, Microsoft for advertising also offers a product remarketing as well. They were very late to the game. That's only sort of about a year ago. Um, you can do dynamic remarketing in Meta um, using um, Facebook catalog ads or the new Advantage ads, um, which are a bit like Performance Max where everything's sort of automated. But when you do do um, dynamic remarketing, you definitely should use the Google Tag Manager to add your tracking pixels or tracking code. And you also need to mark up the page so that the ad platforms know what products you were actually looking at. And then you need to link your feed because instead of you creating thousands of individual image ads, it actually takes the image from the feed in the same way that shopping ads does. So it speeds that whole process up. For cross-channel um, remarketing strategies, you can do various different things. So a good example will be Google ads um, based on video views in YouTube, uh, cross-channel remarketing. So somebody that um, you target in Facebook came, comes across to your website and then you can use something called remarketing lists for search ads in shopping. So effectively, that's like search remarketing. So you can bid higher. Um, you can do audiences based on vanity pages. So if you've got a URL such as um, integrate hyphen book and I've got that in um, uh, an event uh, and then people then come to that page, I can then remarket to them. You've got car abandoners, even thing, you know, you can direct them to Amazon. And then you've got a whole load of Facebook audiences that you can use. And the advantage of Facebook and Meta is that the audience size is much smaller than the other platforms. And there's a, um, and um, and it's really good for things like remarketing to existing customers, for any clients that are about to renew or their contract's about to end. And even as um, privacy um, taken into consideration, you can even up, um, upload your eBay lists and your um, lists from offline um, databases. <clears throat> One of the concepts of cross-channel marketing is the idea of honeypots. And this is where you use some really cheap traffic. It could be something like um, Facebook, but it could be free organic traffic. Um, and you get them over to your website. Um, you then build a list based on the people um, that have come in from that particular campaign. And then you then target them so that only they're the people that see that particular ad. So this would be a good example. If you were if you were bidding on the word garden furniture in Google, you get so many people of different types of garden furniture. But if you know that they're interested in your very expensive premium rattan garden furniture, uh, then uh, because they've downloaded a guide, then you're much more likely to want to remarket to them. A couple of more strategies then. So things like um, it's definitely worth remarketing creating analytics audiences. And if you've currently got audiences set up in GA3, um, you need to convert those over to the new GA4. Um, you've got a choice of putting your remarketing in observation mode, which is normally where you start, where you overlay lots of audiences onto existing campaigns and start to see what works. If something works really well, then you can um, then uh, increase the bid. And if it doesn't work very well, you can decrease the bid. Whereas other types of campaigns, they will only be shown to that remarketing audience. And that's what we mean by targeting. But generally, collect the data and re review the performance. And if, it, if, it, if that particular segment or audience is working really well, then um, you, know, you can modify the bin a bit higher because they're going to be more valuable to you. With regard to Meta, Facebook and Instagram and Messenger, you definitely need the uh, Meta Pixel, although I'm going to be talking about overcoming some of the tracking issues caused by Apple in just a second. Create custom audiences, create lookalike audiences. But because of tracking issues, you know, you, it is worth using custom audiences based on people that have engaged within the platform. So if they've, you know, if they've um, commented or shared or, or looked at one of your organic posts um, or they've um, viewed a, 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 an ad, an awareness ad, or watched a video, then those are going to be very good for creating audiences. And then test, compare the different audiences and determine which are the most effective. I've just got some examples here. I won't go through this list, but definitely try and target people that are converters. They're particularly powerful for URL, uh, for lookalikes. Um, also, you can target people based on the amount of when they bought um, and um, also the type of ads that they've used. And you can also target people based on content as well. So if they've read your blog or they've watched any videos on your site or any organic traffic, 
So you can set up events um, in GA, Google Analytics, to track these things. Um, and then that will help with setting up audiences as well. OK, so I'm just checking how much time I've got. So I've got five minutes to cover the last section. So this is the most complicated part of what we're doing at the moment. There are some tools to help you do some of this stuff. Um, and, but in, it, depends, it really depends on what platform you're working with. Uh, data integration and tracking automation is particularly important if you've got a lot of traffic, uh, particularly if you're doing a lot of e-commerce um, and if you want to do a lot of paid social. But it does have other benefits as well. So if you're a tiny little site, um, you may not find this as useful. Um, but any of you that are actually investing any money in marketing at all should be looking at this stuff. So first of all, um, we've got something called enhanced conversion tracking in Google. Um, and so this is to track conversions better, particularly as cookies and iOS um, starts to reduce the data that we um, uh, have. So effectively, you do have to um, make some changes and you do have to enable it within Google Ads. Um, but the way that it works is, is that a, a user clicks on your website and goes across and makes a purchase or fills in the form. We capture that data. Um, using the data layer, as it is explained here. And then that data is encrypted and sent across to Google. And then they match it with the people that are logged in um, versus the ID of that individual conversion. So although they don't know the individual, they know who that conversion was um, and they know the characteristics of that individual. And then they can use that to target more people. And this will become even more important as things like um, the cookie uh, in Chrome, which I, is supposed to happen in 2024. So, but this is available now. And if you're spending any money on Google Ads, you should be looking at this. The next one I want to talk about is moving away from what we call client side or browser side tracking to server side tracking and the use of conversion APIs. Now, um, I'll give you a little bit of background behind this. This was all to do with Apple um, two years ago when they introduced their privacy changes in iOS 14. And basically, everybody had to tick a box um, to say that they're happy um, to use apps on an Apple phone or an Apple device um, and have their, um, their behavior tracked. And of course, everybody said no. So, or majority of people said no. So what happened then was um, that tracking meant that when you do ads where people come over to your website or where they convert and you need to send that information back to um, places like Meta and Pinterest and TikTok, that, that data, data just basically disappeared overnight. But if you think about it, when somebody comes to your website and they convert, all that information is being held at the back end of your website on your server. So you do have the data, but what you need to do is connect the dots and connect the conversion with the data and then find a mechanism to send it back to um, the ad platforms so that they've got the data as well. And then if they've got the data as well, then that data can be used by them to actually improve the campaign. Now, at the moment, the way that uh, data has been tracked is through um, the browser. And so you have cookies and that information sent directly through to Facebook um, and all the other ad platforms. I've got some diagrams in a minute to show you. So if you can, if you've lost all your data, because most people are using mobile phones, mo a lot of people are using Apple and you've got cookie to being um, phased out in safaris, you know, they only last 24 hours, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you want to retain that information, what's going to happen is that the performance of your ads will improve because um, the ad platforms have now got the conversion data. That means that they've got you can optimize which ads work better, which ones don't. And also they can find people that are more likely to convert. So as you get more and more data, the conversions become more effective. Also, if you know who's converted, you can also create um, audiences for remarketing purposes and for lookalike purposes as well. So what's happened is, um, as a result of all this change, is that the ad platforms have all introduced their own conversion API 
or CAPI, as it's often abbreviated to. And it allows um, um, advertisers to import their conversion data into the API so that that can then be shown in the admin or the ad manager account of those platforms. And Pinterest, TikTok um, have all got these. So let's just have a look at server side tracking first of all. Now, there's lots of benefits of using server side tracking rather than the client side tracking, because first of all, ad blockers and the privacy changes will block that data, whereas using server side, you get most of it. And because you're not sending multiple um, requests to and sending lots of data to lots of different places, it can serve up, it can speed up your website and it can improve the security because you can collect data such as profit data which we can use for e-commerce sales. So in the client side situation, the user browser sends the third party tags over to the external servers and your server's not really involved in that. With the server side, the user browser, the tags are there are then, and the data is then sent from our web server across to the destination servers. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like in a bit more detail in a minute. And then effectively, in order for you to do this, you've got two steps. The first step is the server side tracking to collect the conversion data. Obviously, you can collect a lot of other data as well and stick it up to the cloud. And then secondly, you then use the conversion API to send the conversion data over to the ad platform. So let's show you what that looks like. So in the good old fashioned days, we'd have a, um, a, a, a browser on the device and it would send a server request and then your website would appear. So your, the device is already connected to the server to get the actual website to appear. So what we do is we add a Google ta um, Tag Manager on the client side, and this then has um, the analytics tag, the Facebook tag, the Pinterest tag, <clears throat> and that is what's sent over to Facebook and analytics. Now it's really easy to block this. You can put an ad blocker in here, you can use iOS 14, and this side can easily fall down. However, that has to happen so when something happens over here and you've got a google tag manager container effectively what you're doing is those two talk to each other and then what we do when we set this up is that the ga4 client um, or the tag over in the server side then sends the information to um, and the information to analytics it sends the information to facebook so that is tracked that way and um, it may be that the majority of this is lost, but you can still have it in parallel. So this side is client side tracking, this side is server side tracking. So that's the first part. The second part is the conversion API. So again, your server is providing the website to the browser. And what happens is the, uh, the pixels through Google Tag Manager, you can imagine Google Tag Manager sitting here. Um, that will then send the data to Facebook in this case over to Meta. And then where you're clicking away, managing the account, you can see those conversions. Now, with the ad blockers, with iOS 14, those conversions are significantly reduced and you've got a lot, le lot less data. But by using the server side tracking and the CAPI, that conversion can then be inputted. And so you're going to get the data and you're going to be able to manage the campaign and make much better decisions. The campaigns are going to run more effectively because you've now got the, the CAPI working. So we actually implemented this for Books to Door and we're implementing it with quite a lot of other um, websites at the moment. And this is the stuff where we won four awards, including the best large paid uh, media agency. So there's Ed and uh, Emil. Um, Emil was doing all the social and Ed was helping with the tracking. Um, so if you wanna read about the case study, you can go and read here, just to show you how effective it was. Um, this is similar web data, which is third party data, which I can publish. I can't publish any confidential data. The project started here and you can see here's Books to Door going along quite nicely. They've got about a third of the market share. This is the other nine competitors that I was comparing, or eight competitors I was comparing with them. We started implement, and you can see just how much of the market share, and they became the market leaders um, by December, by November, November December, um, and an um, almost double of traffic um, during that time. Uh, this is again similar web data. I've uh, anonymized it so you can't see the actual data, and this is all the channels. So the yellow is the social. 
But what you notice, a massive spike in direct traffic as well. Um, SEO was going up as well. Um, there was an increase in demand, which you expect around Christmas for kids' books. But the thing that I wanted to tell you was that um, there's, um, we noticed a direct correlation between the, um, the social ads and direct traffic because of um, either it's assisting in conversions, which we saw, but also the misattribution because direct is like a dumping ground within Google Analytics. And since publishing this, um, Spark Toro has published information to show just how often, if you want to go and look this up, just how often um, social media traffic is dumped into direct um, and is misattributed. So you can see lots of these channels, um, you won't even see the sales in Google Analytics. So you could be looking at your Google Analytics and say, where's all my Facebook, where's all my social channel sales? I can see them over in Facebook, but I can't see them in analytics. And that's because it's being misattributed. Finally, in my last few minutes, I think I've got about a minute left. Um, I just wanted to talk about profit based bidding for e-commerce products with variable margins. So this is the concept that different products can have very different gross margins. So I've got two products here, product one, product two, both £100. But because of the increased product cost, this has got a margin of 50 quid. And this has got a margin of 20 quid. Now, if any of you are doing e-commerce and shopping ads, you know that that's very problematic because when we bid in shopping ads, we use a target of, say, five to one revenue. So you can see that if my ads cost 20 pounds, um, I made five to one based on revenue. But if you look at the actual gross margin, I only made 30, uh, 50 pounds there and 20 pounds there. By the time I knock off my ad cost, I've made no money at all in this case. So what we're talking about is what we call profit on ad spend rather than revenue or return on ad spend. And you can see in this case, we made 2.5. In that case, we made one to one. So how can we implement this? Well, first of all, you've got to manually, um, one strategy is to manually adjust your ROAS targets for smart bidding. So if you've got products with different margins, then you can label your products in your product feed, group them together and create campaigns. And you can do this in Meta as well. Uh, group the campaigns based on the product profit margin. And then if they've got a low prof prof profit margin, then you bid higher for them. Alternatively, you can do what we call profit based biddings. And this is this is automatic. This is the stuff that we're working with clients now. So we extract the cost and profit data from your website and add it to your product feed. It's dynamic. It's changing all the time. Then you use labels to create the Google shopping campaign structure. So in some cases, they will even move around between campaigns based on the profit margin. You export the profit data as well as the revenue from the shopping cart. So you actually get the every time there's a sale, you use that server side tracking to get that profit out. And then you import that back into Google Ads. So effectively, you overwrite the revenue that's used in ROAS bidding with the profit. And then when Google works, it uses instead of using a ROAS target, it's using a POAS target. And then that way you can maximize the amount of profit you make rather than the amount of revenue you make. And that's described in this diagram where step one is identifying the margin for each product. This is your product information scheme. This is your website. So get that data over into the product, into, it into the website, get that into your Google feed, into the merchant center. Step two is get that feed and labels and create the campaigns over in Google. Step three is to extract the profit from the shopping cart on the thank you page. Get that through server side tracking into your campaigns. And step four is to change the bid in from POAS, not ROAS, and then maximize. So if you've got a sale on and your prices change, it will dynamically uh, amend it so you're always trying to target the maximize, uh, maximize amount of profit, not the amount of revenue that you get. OK, so I'm not going to go through all those takeaways now, but the main thing you need to be aware of is you need to avoid becoming a dinosaur because as so many things are changing now with automation and privacy um, and the use of things like chat, GPT and AI, um, you need to integrate to avoid becoming a dinosaur. Uh, that's it. Now, there's lots of things we can help you with. Um, I know we're going to bring you a couple of um, um, offers now. So I'm just going to 
close my slides. Um, go, welcome Gurpreet back in. And oh, I've gone over. I thought I would do. I always tend to go over on mine, I'm afraid. Um, shall we bring some offers up, Gurpreet? And is there any questions? I think you're on mute, Gurpreet. Oh, I've done a classic. Am I back? <laughs> I suppose the most important thing is to send them over the book, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, and also, oh. yeah, just some great feedback. Um, a lot of people said it's really interesting. They'll probably have to have a rewatch because there's so much info. So, yeah, the um, download should be going out in a couple of hours time and then up onto YouTube as well. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, I I was trying to do it in more detail, so I've got a sort of a r r record of it in enough detail because before when I've done this presentation, I've skipped a lot of the explanation of how the server side and the CAPI works. But I think it's becoming so important now that people need to underst understand it. Um, there are shortcuts to setting it up in some platforms like Shopify, um, Big Commerce, and WooCommerce. There's some plugins to help you, but if you've got Magento, the, there's not as many. Um, and if you've got a bespoke platform, then you're going to have to do it manually. Um, it really depends what you want to do. Um, there are some third party um, products out there as well. But if you are interested, if you contact me um, and the team, um, we can help you. Um, and in the meantime, let's just stick up a couple of. Um, yeah. So if you think that's useful, um, if you want to leave us a review, um, that would be brilliant. Or we've got the reviews to IO. And then the other thing I was going to say, is there, um, is there anything else that we, we said we were going to... I've put your consultancy um, pop-up on if, you, if anybody wants to chat with you, Anne. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you want to load that up? That would be brilliant. Yeah. Here it is. I'm not going to be around much next week because I'm going, I've got a couple of expos and events to go to. Um, but um, it links through to my Calendly. Um, so if you want to book, if you can book the week after next, that would be amazing. And, um, usually Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays are the best day for me because uh, obviously we're here. That's brilliant. Um, is there any other questions? I think that's everything. But a lot of love hearts and um, smiley faces coming through for you, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, everybody. Speak to you soon. Brilliant. Thank Bye. you. Bye.